Hey everybody, it's time for another chapter of Runaway Ralph. This is chapter six and it's titled, A Thief in the Craft Shop. Let's see what's going to happen to Ralph now. At first the sign over Ralph's cage was the cause of argument. But Aunt Jill, how come Garth is the one who gets to feed the mouse? The campers asked. I want to feed the mouse too. Why can't I feed the mouse? It isn't fair. Nobody else has a mouse. Aunt Jill always gave the same answer. Garf gets to feed the mouse because the mouse is his. He caught it in a butterfly net. This policy ins inspired some of the campers to go mouse hunting and big game hunting, they called it, with butterfly nets. But when no mice were caught, enthusiasm waned and the campers gradually lost interest. Catso followed someone into the craft shop whenever he could, and whenever he succeeded, Aunt Jill said, Someone had better put that cat out. Usually, Lana was the one who picked up the cat so and held him with his face over her shoulder as if he were a baby. Poor baby, she would say. There's a picture of cat so. Her holding cat so. He's a big cat. My goodness. She would put cat so on her back as if she were burping an infant. Ralph found the smug look on Katso's face most annoying. Garf was happy, but Ralph was not. The boy showed no signs of running away, and now that he abided by the rules, the two of them were never alone. The bars of Ralph's cage enclosed a very small area, and no matter how fast he ran on his wheel, he remained in the same place. He began to sit motionless for long periods of time while he thought more and more about the freedom he had enjoyed back at the Mountain View Inn. He missed those long corridors and his exciting expeditions in search of food, what he had once called crumb scrounging now seemed like a test of courage. He even came to admit that he had missed his little brothers and sisters and cousins. They were nuisances, but they were livelier than a grumpy hamster. Perhaps he wouldn't get mined at all, giving some of the little mice, boy mice, of course, short rides on his motorcycle after all if he ever got back. Most of all, Ralph missed that motorcycle. He clutched the wires of his cage, recalling the nights he had sped through the corridors of the old hotel while guests snored behind closed doors, tried to pretend they were the, on the grips of the handlebars. It was no use. The wires remained what they were, the bars of a small prison, higher, but not as long as in an economy-sized Kleenex box. Ralph grew listless. So great was his homesickness that choice tidbits from the dining hall tempted him less and less. He sometimes skipped meals, preferring instead to curl up in a corner under some shredded paper where he dozed, dreaming of dark nights, smooth floors, and speed on the motorcycle. Cheer up, said Chum. You'll get used to a cage. Ralph did not answer. It wa He wanted to be alone with his thoughts. Garf, on the other hand, no longer wanted to be alone. He came into the craft shop to tend to Ralph while other campers were present. And soon he became interested in the tools in the shop and finally went to work with some other boys building wooden boats to float in the irrigation ditch. One long morning, Ralph passed the time by watching a girl named Karen. Karen was one of the older campers, a girl 12 or 13 years old with long blonde hair, which that morning was wet. All the other girls washed their hair several times a week. Karen was making an old plastic bleach bottle into a piggy bank. She turned it on its side so the handle was on top glued corks in place for legs, cut a slit under the handle, and painted eyes above the spout, which was now the piggy bank snout. Ralph noticed that Karen paused from time to time to scratch her left arm. Finally, Karen set her paintbrush across the top of the paint jar and removed her wristwatch, which she laid on the shelf beside Ralph's cage. He could hear it tick. She scratched the spot where the watch had been, returned, it to, her returned to her painting, and then stopped to scratch again. Karen! Let me see your arm, said Aunt Jill, who was showing a boy how to lace together a wallet. Why, it looks to me as if you have a poison oak. You had better go see the nurse about it and be careful not to scratch it. But Aunt Jill, it feels so good to scratch, said Karen, tossing back her hair. I know, but scratching only spreads the poison oak and makes it worse, said Aunt Jill. Now run along and see the nurse. I'll wash out your paintbrush for you. It's almost time for the dinner bell. When the bell rang for the noon meal and the craft shop was empty, Ralph felt his fur rise along his spine. Sure enough, just as he expected, there was that curious paw of Katso exploring the hole in the screen door. Then the pink nose appeared. 
Catso must have pushed hard because the rusty screen gave way and the rest of his head appeared. Catso did not stop there. He pushed and wriggled until he got one shoulder and then the other through the hole. Then came Catso's front feet followed by the rest of the beast. Catso was in the craft shop. Where was Sam? Ralph scuttled to the far corner of his cage where he turned his back to the world and tried to make himself invisible. He heard Catso land lightly on the work table beneath his cage and knew that this time there was no one to snatch the cat and shove him out the door. Ralph waited, but when nothing happened, he summoned the courage to peek over his shoulder. Catso was calmly washing himself and appeared not to even notice. Ralph was not fooled for an instant. He knew Catso was aware of every move he made. Drat that cat, he thought bitterly, as his heart beat faster than the tick of the watch on the shelf beside his cage. Catso licked his right paw over and over with great care and began to wash his right ear. That's right, thought Ralph. Take your time. He was worn out from bracing himself for the pounce that did not come. A real war of nerves, he thought, just when that cat wants, just to test me. He's got me where he wants me, and he knows it. Catso groomed his left paw, currying, carrying his fur neatly in the direction of his toes. He used his teeth to pull bits of dried mud from between his paw pads and then began to scrub behind his ear. Well, come on, thought Ralph. Get it over. You don't have to be so neat. He would just as soon be knocked off the shelf by a cat with dirty ears as a cat with clean ears. Cats had finished washing, looked at Ralph, and glanced away. Ralph, who was familiar with that maneuver, thought, Here it comes. But this time Ralph was mistaken. Cats's attention had been caught by the leather strap of the wristband hanging over the edge of the shelf. He tapped it with a curious paw and watched it swing back and forth. Ralph's blood chilled as claws appeared from the exploring paw that batted the strap once more. Then the claws hooked the watch strap and dragged the watch down to the work table. Why, that silly cat actually thinks the watch band is a tail, thought Ralph as an, an astonishment. Cats have sat very listening, still listening to the watch tick. He batted it experimentally with his paw, but the watch lay as still as any terrified mouse. While Ralph watched in fascination, Catso picked up the watch in his mouth and with the strap hanging down like a tail, leaped from the table to the floor where he dropped the watch, batted it about, picked it up again, and slipped out his hole in the screen door. Ralph ventured out of his corner and with shaking paws clung to the wires of his cage to see what had happened next. Catso played with the watch a while on the bamboo leaves, but when a cook with a pan of scraps in his hand opened the kitchen door, the greedy animal dropped the watch and ran off to be fed. The watch slid on a smooth bamboo husk until it came to rest, hidden from sight under some leaves. Talk about close calls, said Chum. Silly cat, said Ralph in a weak voice. Ralph was dazed by the whole experience, but he noticed Garf leaving the dining hall when the campers began to sing one of their favorite songs, up in the air, Junior Birdman, up in the air and upside down, up in the air, Junior Birdman, keep your nose off the ground. Come into the craft shop, Ralph pleaded silently. True to his promise to Aunt Jill, the boy did not enter the craft shop, but sat alone with his thoughts, twirling idly in a tire suspended from one of the trees and singing to his private tune, when you hear the doorbell ring and see the badge of tin, you'll know the junior bird man have turned their box tops in. B-I-R-D-M-E-N. Yay! Before long, Karen, her left arm covered with white lotion, came running into the craft shop with two of her friends. My watch, she cried suddenly. Ralph scurried into a corner. It's gone. Somebody must have taken it, said one of her friends, an older girl who was wearing polished English riding boots. I'll bet it was that Garf Jen again, said the second friend. I'll bet it was too, said the girl in English riding boots. I saw him leaving the dining hall earlier. She brushed dust from the toe of her boot. Girls who own English riding boots were proud of them and shined them quite often. Karen tried to be fair. We don't know it was Garf, and we didn't see him come in here. The girls crowded around the screen door to meet Aunt Jill, who had paused on her way to the shop to talk to someone. Aunt Jill, Aunt Jill, they cried. Karen's watch is gone. Aunt Jill, we have a mystery, cried Lana, who had tagged along the older girls in a dirty, in dirty cowboy boots. She liked the dirt on her boots, which showed she was not a newcomer to the camp. 
Everyone wanted to hear about the missing watch. Campers crowded around Aunt Jill and the three girls. Through the open window, Ralph could hear snatches of conversation. Aunt Jill, I'm sure I left on the shelf beside the mouse cage. I'm positive. I looked everywhere. I just can't find it anywhere. I saw Garf, and he was his, it was my birthday present. Searched the lodge. He sneaks out of the dining hall. Hasn't even excused from the table. Now, girls, now, girls, calm down, saying Aunt Jill. Well, I don't care. He just acts funny, said the girls. The cat really has fixed things now, thought Ralph, as the campers gathered on the benches and at the old school desks under the walnut trees. One of the counselors led the singing, and then Aunt Jill stepped up on the platform. Campers, I have some unhappy news today. And she began. Karen's watch is missing from the craft shop, where she was sure she laid it on the shelf. It was not an expensive watch, but it, has a, it was a birthday present to Karen, and she would like very much to have it back. And Karen nodded her head vigorously, and Aunt Jill went on. We are not going to search the lodges as someone suggested. We are going to let the person who took the watch return it because it's the right thing to do. A lot Casso, Katso cares about doing the right thing, thought Ralph. He heard Garf, who was sitting on the last bench, say angrily to the boy in front of him, What are you looking at me for? Aunt Jill continued, No one needs to know who took the watch. It can be returned to the shelf in the craft room when no one is looking or onto my or put on my desk in the office. We are not interested in who took the watch. We just want it returned to Karen because returning it is the right thing to do. After Aunt Jill's speech, the campers began to sing, You are my sunshine. Garf slipped away from the rest of the campers and, as Aunt Jill has suggested, sat down by himself behind the clump of bamboo. This afternoon was the first time Ralph had seen him sit there. You make me happy, sang the campers. They haven't made Garf happy, that thought Ralph, wishing that Garf were sitting on the other side of the bamboo near the craft shop door where he might find the watch by accident. That boy is in real trouble, remarked Chum. Ralph turned to surprise. In surprise, I thought you were asleep under your cedar shavings, he remarked. That's what I made them think, said Chum. I didn't miss a thing. What is your opinion of the case, asked Ralph, who knew the right words to use in such a situation from watching so many television programs in the lobby of the Mountain View Inn. I think that boy is in a tight spot, said Chum. Everybody knows he used to come into the craft shop when no one was here, and they know he is still the first person to leave the dining hall, so naturally, everyone thinks he took the watch. He obviously can't return the watch because he doesn't know where it is, so of course everyone will think he's keeping it. That's the way I had it figured, agreed Ralph. All right, let me show you. I forgot to show you this picture. Here's a picture of Katso with the watch. See him carrying it in his mouth before he dropped it? Okay. And then here is Garf sitting on the bamboo with his thoughts, thinking what is going to be happening. And I'll tell you one thing, continued Chum. He's not going to come near the craft shop until that watch is found. But what about me, squeaked Ralph in dismay, thinking of the sign above his cage. Nobody else feeds me. I'll starve. I'll try to toss you in an alfalfa pellet once in a while, said Chum generously. My aim isn't very good, but I should be able to get one in your cage now and then, enough to keep you going. Going where, wondered Ralph? No place. What was to become of him when the summer ended and all the campers went home? Would Garf take away? Would Garf take him away, or would everyone forget him and leave him to starve to death? He didn't want to spread the rest, spend the rest of his life in a cage, and he certainly did not want to be kept alive on a few cast-off alfalfa pellets, only to starve at the end of the summer. There was just one answer. Ralph had to escape. The campers finished a rousing chorus of, You are my sunshine, when Ralph's sharp ears caught a sound that had, had him on his feet in an instant. It was a sound a boy uses to make a toy motorcycle go. It was made softly, as if by a boy alone in his thoughts. Garf had found Ralph's motorcycle. Hey! squeaked Ralph at the top of his small voice. That's my motorcycle. Garf stopped, pushing the motorcycle across the bamboo leaves just long enough to make Ralph think he might have heard him. Then, to Ralph's disappointment, 
He put the motorcycle in the pocket of his jeans and went off toward his lodge for the rest period required of all campers. Ralph was so excited he left the bars of his cage and went for a run on the wheel. Gar spoke his language. He knew how to make the motorcycle go. There was hope after all. All Ralph had to do was explain to Garf, as Ralph thought the matter over, his exercise wheel moved more and more slowly until it came to a stop, and Ralph sat back on his haunches. His plan would not work until Garf was cleared of the theft of the watch. He was not, he was not going to risk coming into the craft shop. Ralph had to agree that Chum was right this time. All right, that's the end of that chapter. And I'll see you next time for Chapter 7.